Welcome everyone to our webinar, Great Rivers Trumpeter Swans. This is Margaret Smith and the Executive Director of the Trumpeter Swan Society. And this is one of our ongoing monthly webinars about swan stories in different parts of North America. And we're really excited to have today's webinar and speakers. Um, before we get started, just some housekeeping uh, details here. The webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link through Zoom with the recording later this week. Um, as a participant, you are muted and your video is turned off and we welcome your questions. So if you have a question, put it in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen and we hope to get to those at the end. And um, like I said, we really welcome your questions. At the end of the webinar, there will be a very brief survey at the end um, when your browser is um, beginning to end. And before we get started, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the Trumpeter Swan Society. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We've been around since 1968, so more than 50 years that we've been working across North America on Trumpeter Swan restoration and issues. We have several different programs. One of them is education. And this webinar is one of our education programs. We have YouTube videos that explain um, swan behavior. And every few years we have swan conferences where we bring together biologists and agency people and the general public to share current information about trumpeter swans. And in 2019, we actually had our swan conference at Riverlands. And so I've been there and it's a wonderful place to go. So I hope you'll be able to visit it too. We also restore swans in the West. We have an organ restoration project. If there are swan issues or threats, uh, we work in it. We, so we have advocacy. We work with the flyways on different swan management plans, and we also help fund research. So if you're a member, you know about the GPS tracking projects in the West and in the Midwest, and we're one of the partners in that. And we also have Trumpeter Watch program where people can report uh, swan sightings to us. So that's what we do in a nutshell. Um, if you're not a member, we sure hope that you would join and you know bec become part of helping make all this happen. I wanna introduce a couple people from the Trumpeter Swan Society you know, behind the scenes. So there's Jim Hawkins and Tiffany May also. Uh, Jim is here from the Yukon. He's a board member. Um, he's retired from the Canadian Wildlife Service. And if you attended our Yukon webinar, he was the main speaker there. So Jim will be looking for your questions in the Q&A section, and he will be the ones asking those at the end. And Tiffany Mayo, Tiffany, if you're there. Uh, Tiffany is our uh, education program chair, and she's also um, in charge of the swans really at the zoos across North America. So we have the Oregon Restoration Project that I mentioned, and Tiffany works with the zoos across the country to see that we get young swans and cygnets that hatch at those zoos to come out um, um, and be released um, into the wild in Oregon. So uh, our speakers today are going to be um, Tara Holman, Emily Connor, Tyler Goble, and Paul Moffitt from um, Audubon and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And so, uh, Tara, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you for the introduction. And I will, I'm assuming everyone can hear me okay. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining us today. I'm here to chat about our Great Rivers Trumpeter Swan. And for those who aren't familiar with the Great Rivers area, we'll definitely be diving into that more. Um, but before we start, I'm gonna go ahead and do introductions for all us folks who will be chatting with you from our area. Um, so I'm Tara Holman. I'm the Conservation Science Manager for Audubon's Upper Mississippi River Region, based here out of the Audubon Center at Riverlands, which is just north of St. Louis, Missouri. So I'm joined with Emily Connor. She's our education manager here at the Audubon Center, um, as well as Tyler Goebel. He is a wildlife biologist with the Coors River Project Office, which is again, right here on the sanctuary in the same area. And then lastly, we will be joined by Paul Moffitt, birder and photographer extraordinaire, um, great swan volunteer, all, all of the above. So we'll, each of us will have our own time um, to chat. I know both myself and Emily will be leading us through our presentation today. 
And then for any kind of specific questions later, um, both Tyler and Paul will be able to help answer some of those depending on the questions that you have. All right, and I'm gonna pass this over to Emily and I'm going to turn off my video. Thanks so much, Tara. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and just to give you a little bit of overview, so I'm Emily Connor. I'm the education manager at the Audubon Center, and I'm primarily doing a lot of work around uh, environmental education and community engagement through many public events, public outreach, and, and things such as that. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we're located. Um, so just to give you an idea, the overview of our webinar today, we will be touching on the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary, as I'm sure many of you may not have been there before. So we'll give you a little bit of uh, onboarding on that. Uh, then we're going to be diving into the trumpeter swans that we receive at Riverlands and a little bit about the history of that story. And then finally, we're going to be touching on the Great Rivers Trumpeter Swan Watch, which helps us engage community members and volunteers um, to help us monitor these amazing birds that show up um, in our region. Um, and so just to give you an idea of where we are located. So here um, you can see the Mississippi Flyway is highlighted and we are located in uh, Missouri. So that red state is kind of where we are, including the bright yellow star. And what makes this so significant is that we are in the center of one of the major flyways in the United States, the Mississippi Flyway. Um, so actually about 60% of migratory species and about 40% of waterfowl within North America will migrate through these corridors. Um, and we also have three major rivers running through this region. Um, the reason that this area is so special is we receive a lot of the swans that are migrating south during the winter time. Um, and we typically start to see our trumpeter swans arrive around that star. They almost always show up on Halloween. So always the end of October or 1st of November. And they do stick around with us uh, through January. Um, so just to give you a little bit of reference there. And now let's zoom in a little bit. So here, if we zoomed in, this is a little snapshot of the Riverlands Migratory Bird Sanctuary. Um, so this is about 3,700 acres of land. And it's very unique because um, it is managed and owned by the Army Corps of Engineers. So this is recognized as public lands. Um, if you do visit us, you will find that there's many different types of habitat. We have grasslands, wetlands, prairie, sand prairie, as well as bottomland forested areas. And then of course we are central right next to the Mississippi River. Um, and so if we look a little bit even further, you're going to see zooming out, um, we have the significant great rivers converging together in our region. So that upper circle, you can see that is the Illinois River um, converging with the Mississippi. And then just a little bit farther down, we have the Missouri River uh, coming together. So the Audubon Center, which is where that yellow star is, was founded in 2011, and it's located, located right within the sanctuary between these two great confluence areas. Um, and we also, again, this is right in the center of one of our major flyways, the Mississippi Flyway. Um, and is also considered an important bird area, both globally and nationally within National Audubon Society. So um, if you haven't been here, here's a nice photo of this of our center. So this is the Audubon Center at Riverlands. Um, and you can see there's a, a awesome opportunity to view wildlife while here um, with our almost 360 of windows overlooking Ellis Bay in the Mississippi River. Um, and to give you an idea, our mission at the Audubon Center of Everlands is really to connect people to the beauty and the significance of the Mississippi River and the Great Confluence area, including the Illinois and Missouri Rivers. And so our hope is really to inspire conservationists um, inspire community members to think about conservation of our river's rich diversity of, of birds, of course, but also other wildlife and other natural resources, 
And so we really firmly believe that if we support healthy, vibrant communities, that what is good for birds is also good for people in our region. And I want to preface that um, a majority of the photos that we're using today are taken by Paul Moffitt, who is an Audubon volunteer, as well as a Trumpeter Swan Society member, um, and with the exception of just two photos from a couple decades ago. Um, all of these photos you're going to see are taken by Paul Moffitt. And here's one you can see at the sanctuary in one of our wetland ponds, um, and not just swans, but other species of uh, ducks and geese as well. All right, so swans at Riverlands. When did it happen? When did we start seeing them? Well, really the first sighting that we had of trumpeter swans was in the winter of 1991. Um, and we originally saw five banded cygnets. Um, and our cygnets is, is another word for juvenile trumpeter swans. And that's why you're seeing that kind of gray color around the head and neck of our swans. Um, and what's really unique and cool to see is that when we see collars, we can tell where this bird was banded and when and by who. And so these five banded cygnets were, uh, we found out that they were released by Becky Abel earlier that year in Wisconsin. So we know these birds were up in Wisconsin earlier that year and made their way down the river to Riverlands. Um, so Trumpeter swans were reintroduced to Wisconsin in 1989. Um, and then that's when they began the collar and kind of monitoring efforts. And, and these collars you'll see, they are designed specifically for the trumpeter swan species. So they are a perfect fit. They're still loose around the neck, um, but just the right size that they don't fall off over their heads. And this is really what's led to some of the data we're gonna share with you guys in a little bit about the swans that we're seeing and where they're coming from. So following 1991, every year we started to see more and more trumpeter swans. So it was a very exciting time. Um, and as we started to notice more and more of these swans, I believe we were really recognizing the needs for management of this species and making sure that this is a true sanctuary where they can seek winter refuge um, through throughout the years. Um, and so some things that we do focus on in terms of um, education and outreach with communities within the St. Louis region um, is we do touch on power line strikes and how we can help manage power lines for our trumpeter swans, as well as hunter angler education, and then understanding their winter habit habitat preferences. Um, and so Working alongside with the Army Corps of Engineers in Audubon, as well as U.S. Fish and Wildlife, we initiated some safety measures for these birds um, and also initiated the Great Rivers Trumpeter Swan Watch. All right, so first let's talk a little bit about power line diverters. So as we began to see trumpeter swans arriving um, after 1991, one thing that we noticed is that um, swans were commonly flying into power lines throughout the sanctuary. Um, we typically probably saw 10 to 20 swan strike mortalities per overwintering season, so per year. Um, and so throughout coordination with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Army Corps of Engineers, they were able to partner with a local utility company called Ameren and came up with the, this idea to install these swan flight diverters onto these power lines. So you can see the photo here of a helicopter up along the power lines actually installing these spiral diverters. Um, and there was um, a little bit of um, news um, that we shared with the community to let them know what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and so after the first batch of diverters were installed, um, this was in 2010, um, and this was over about two miles of lines in high flight areas where we recognized there was more of a risk of strikes. Um, we began to see that the swan strikes dropped significantly. Um, and so we were able to tell that this these power line diverters were serving a great purpose and they were deterring swans from flying into them. Um, and so... After the first batch of diverters were installed, we now see less than five mortality strikes per season. So that greatly reduced the number. 
Um, and the Army Corps of Engineers, they will uh, monitor these power line easement areas weekly and help track where we are seeing continued strikes and we'll continue to coordinate installation in these areas to mitigate some of these hazards that our birds are facing. And here's a nice photo of the, the diverter up, up close. So they're really lightweight and they're made out of plastic. Um, really great uh, example of how partnerships and ideas can lead to really directly helping birds um, in our region. So another thing that we like to talk about is hunter and angler education. Um, and so as, as you, some of you may be aware, um, the populations of trumpeter swans greatly declined many years ago. And so we are working hard to um, protect these species and help as much as we can to increase their populations. Um, and one of those uh, is through education through hunting. And so really helping hunters become aware of the differences in identifying different waterfowl. So in this photo, you can actually see um, the difference between a trumpeter swan versus a snow goose. So historically there have been accidents uh, for hunters who have accidentally um, you know, um, hunted a trumpeter swan rather than a snow goose. If you look at the sign, you can see there is a very big difference in size as well as their feathering on these two birds. So really just raising awareness and making sure hunters are very aware of the size differences and the identifications that are required um, whenever you are hunting waterfowl. Um, and so in this effort to reduce shooting swans, we you know spread awareness, um, have signs up and um, let hunters know that this is something to be aware of. Um, and so because of this, we've actually seen a less frequency in the misidentification of these swans versus other waterfowl that you can hunt. Um, and so the Army Corps of Engineers uh, work alongside with the local natural resource agencies to continue and try to educate hunters about these differences. And if there is an issue, to have it reported immediately so that, that they can address those um, finally, thinking about anglers, because we're uh, surrounded by water in our region, is really just raising awareness around the use of lead tackle and its harms on wildlife. So we do often promote lead-free tackle and do often teach um, eco-friendly fishing classes for the community members to raise awareness of some of the hazards that fishing tackle and line have on waterfowl especially. And then we also have um, receptacles all around our sanctuary where folks can properly dispose of line, hooks, uh, lead sinkers, and things such as that. Um, so if we happen to find an injured trumpeter swan, perhaps from a shooting incident or ingesting lead, um, a lot, oftentimes that is reported directly to the Corps or Audubon. And then we would take direct action and collecting these birds and getting them straight over to a wildlife reha rehabber. So we do partner with Treehouse Wildlife Center um, and they often would take in waterfowl and treat them for any injuries or illnesses that they might have. And what's really exciting is we've had some great success stories with this, with birds that have been taken from Riverlands to rehab were then later re-released on our sanctuary and, and given another chance back out into the wild. Um, so that was really exciting to see a swan release out here at Riverlands. And then that final piece that I think is just so important is the outreach and education that we do in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and we have made a concerted effort to introduce visitors to trumpeter swans, tell them about the story of their recovery and the history of um, what their populations had faced and as well as the importance of conserving and protecting the habitats for this specific bird. So we do host special swan programs that occur at the center during their overwintering season. And so this typically would be taking place in December and January. January is a big month for us to do swan programs and swan events at Riverlands. We do things such as um, guided swan trumpeter swan hikes along the sanctuary, um, and we also engage school groups through swan themed field trips. Um, and it is really exciting to see some of these kids come out and see a trumpeter swan for the first time. Just realize how large and majestic these birds are. 
um, really sparking that sense of wonder and interest in the species. Um, the regional tourism um, that we have partnered with, with Audubon and the Corps, also help provide visitors with information about these upcoming events and where you can view swans in the region and what their numbers are currently at each year. Um, and so with that, all these photos you can see here are just folks inside of our building, maybe along our trails, or perhaps viewing birds um, at our wetland areas. We also do a really fun um, region-wide scavenger hunt. And we did feature a wooden painted trumpeter swan as a hidden bird that folks had to go out and find um, in our local areas. So really exciting stuff. Um, we really enjoy um, expressing our, our interest and love of trumpeter swans with the community. So I believe I'm going to turn it back over to Tara and she's going to dive a little bit more into um, the conservation side of things. How many how many trumpeter swans are we getting each year? How are we counting them? Things like that. Thanks, Emily. Yes, I'm going to start us off with some of our, here we go, um, monitoring and management methods that we have on the sanctuary. So here's yet again, another great photo action shot of one of our trumpeter swans um, from a few years back. So back in 2011, we worked with the Corps and the Trumpeter Swan Society to develop the Great Rivers Trumpeter Swan Watch. So this was really focused on understanding the different behavior and habitat preferences of these wintering swans. Again, these are birds that are coming down to us at the end of October and sticking around pretty much till the end of February. Since these were just, this was just a few years or a decade or so after us seeing our first swans returning to the sanctuary, this was really important for us to try to start understanding how these birds were going to be using these wintering grounds in the region where they hadn't been seen for so many years. So some of our Swan Watch objectives included looking, of course, at the locations of swans. We originally had a set of about five to seven different locations across the confluence region. Um, it's now just pretty much um, sectioned right on the sanctuary. And back then we were, well, now and then we were also looking at the total number of swans we were seeing, including cygnets and adults the species of swans that we saw during these counts. So we, where we are, we typically see predominantly trumpeter, but we have, are prone to see tundra at certain parts of the year as well. We were also identifying any certain behavior that was displayed so we could figure out how they were interacting with each other in the environment. And then we were also looking at where they were coming from, especially with those marked swans that we were able to successfully ID that was a big indicator on us figuring out where they were breeding before they were coming down to us for the wintering ground. Also looking at some of those potential issues, whether it's habitat or mitigation, like we already covered. And then we also note any other waterfowl in the surrounding area, since we are prone to seeing our swans hanging out with quite a few different waterfowl species as they all use the sanctuary over this winter period. So the watch itself runs from November to February. So right when we start seeing swans and larger numbers show up, we, we typically start our count. And that's typically the first week of November, sometimes the second, depending on the weather. And this is a volunteer-based program. We actually have a phenomenal volunteer coordinator named Pat Luters, who's been leading this out since um, the beginning of the watch. And she helps coordinate our volunteers and helps report any bans, all of the above. She's amazing. Um, but we really couldn't do this without all the volunteer help that we have. And I think we also, Paul, Paul is one of our volunteers for this watch. I believe there should be a handful of other um, volunteers for our watch participating today. So big thanks to all of them. Um, but our teams go out in groups of two to three Sometimes when we have a lot of interest from volunteers, we'll have larger groups go out. But we typically have one recorder and one observer 
So you're stationed at different wetland areas across the sanctuary looking for swans that are roost that have roosted overnight. Um, and this is done every two weeks starting a half hour before sunrise. And our counts typically last for an about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on the volume of swans and the activity, whether or not they're really quick to leave or if they're having a lazy morning and they're hanging around. So just an idea of kind of how this works for us. So when we hit one of our spots about half hour before sunrise, it's typically pretty dark outside. Um, we typically use a scope and binoculars and we start scanning the wetland site and we'll start looking for those um, light masses in the dim light that we start with. So that's just giving us a starting number or a rough count to start with. As more light comes in as it becomes later and later in the morning, we're able to solidify that count and really get an accurate number on how many birds we're seeing. As you can imagine, sometimes it's a whole bunch of white clumps out there, and so it takes a while for them to wake up, and then you can start counting egg heads, and then you can start seeing the differences in colors between the adults and the grayer cygnets. And so by the time we have full sunlight coming out, we have a good idea on the total number of swans, the species, and whether they're adults or cygnets at any given wetland site. Once we're done with those counts, we all meet back up at our center and we share the information from each of the sites and we develop our tally. And that's how we do our official counts throughout the season. So most of our swans are typically found at three different habitat types. Um, we have shallow wetlands like shown here. They're typically hanging out amongst the weeds um, like bulrush. Sometimes there'll be areas that used to have arrowhead in it during the spring and are now kind of dormant. We typically see them mixed in with a lot of other waterfowl here in this picture. For instance, we have a lot of mallards in the surrounding area. But of course, that varies depending on what waterfowl we have in and who's all hanging out. We also see them in cornfields. So this typically happens later in the day when our shallow wetlands are still open, um, open water, and they haven't frozen over due to the weather. We'll see them in the shallow wetlands. In later in the evening, or in, sorry, in later in the afternoon, is when we typically see them heading over into the cornfields. And we have a ton of surrounding fields that most of our swans do venture to. Typically during the beginning of their stay with us, they're gonna be staying in the local fields around Missouri and maybe just right over the border into Illinois. But they typically come out here and loaf and forage around in all the corn stubble. Um, for instance, in this photo, we see two cygnets or the two gray ones and three adult trumpeters. You'll notice that one of them has a little bit more of a dirtier tinge look to its feathers. That's just from foraging in the wetland sites and all the minerals and such getting absorbed into those feathers. So you might see a few different um, images of these swans coming up where you might see some that are more maculate white and some that are a little bit more tan. And as it gets colder and colder in our region, um, typically we get a heads up when things start freezing further north than us that it's coming our way. Our swans move into the bay off of the Mississippi River. And this area is just right off our um, center's viewing area so that you can stay inside and you can make counts from inside, which is quite convenient. But they like to hang out in the ice in some of these areas that stay open water even throughout that period. And they're typically joined by all the other waterfowl that are looking for open water as well. Here you see more mix of waterfowl in the back. We also see some gulls up front and some geese. And so we see a big variety of waterfowl utilizing this area this time of year. And so here's an example of some of the counts that we've had since we started these back in 2011. You'll see that our numbers grew fairly steadily from that up until 2017, 2018. 
you'll also see that there is a big drop between 2018 and 2019. So 2019, that summer, we had, that spring summer, we had a huge flooding event in our area. The sanctuary itself was pretty much completely underwater for most of the summer months and most of the growing season for the local vegetation. By the time the water subsided and a lot of our wetland areas reemerged, um, there really wasn't a lot of time for a lot of plants to germinate which meant that there really wasn't a lot of plant matter there for our trumpeter swans to feed on when they came back to their wetland sites in the winter. So that year we had, for that kind of few year period, we had a record low. Um, a lot of our speculation is due to that lack of resources so that they were able to find other areas that weren't as impacted from our flooding. But since then, we haven't had any big major flood events and our numbers have started to climb again. Um, so this is still a great area for trumpeter swans. And it's very fortunate that they're also able to locate other great areas in the region as well as riverlands. But we have one of the largest overwintering populations of trumpeter swans in the region. There's a few other natural areas that might um, be tied with us or might beat us out by a couple hundred, sometimes thousands, depending on the day and the time of the season. But we're one of the biggest and we're the most, I would say we're one of the most easily accessible, especially for swan viewing. So these are some of our high swan counts. Some of these are going to be numbers from our official swan watches. Some of these might be days that weren't during those swan watches or what we might call unofficial counts, but when we saw the most swans utilizing the sanctuary. Um, and so this year we had just 972 was one of the official high counts um, that we had up on eBird. I've had other people tell me that we also had some that were well over a thousand on certain days around that time that just weren't reported. But these days we're typically seeing over a thousand birds on a good day. Typically it's been around like Christmas, if not early January, when things really start to freeze over. So if anyone's interested in visiting us, early January is definitely high, high time to see the most number of swans in our area. So I also wanted to touch on some of these marked swans. So you'll notice that we have quite a few photos that we've shared today already that show swans with uh, markers on their necks. As of this year, we have seen 93 different tagged swans at Riverlands. So you'll notice in all of these photos too that all of the tags that you've seen have been yellow with black lettering. So states have different colors um, so you see, we see yellow here, you might see green or red for a different state. We're able to say that most all of our tag swans have come from Wisconsin because of that yellow marker with the black lettering. So out of those 93 different tag swans that we've seen, they've been banded from 13 different counties in Wisconsin. And that's for all of the individuals we were able to find that information for. So typically when we see a marked swan, we report it to the Trumpeter Swan Society, as well as the Bird Banding Lab. When we do this, we're able to get information back on that swan that tells us when it was tagged, um, where it was tagged from. And so we're able to gauge age, we're able to gauge some distance. And again, Wisconsin seems to be our stronghold for all our swans, because that's typically where we see those marked individuals coming from. These are the 13 different counties in Wisconsin, if you're familiar with the state that um, most of our swans were tagged from. So a lot of them being from some more of the northern counties, but we do have some further, uh, further south as well. So we have one swan that we have seen that has one of those GPS tags that was um, that Margaret talked about earlier. And I have an image of its kind of track that we have um, that I'll show in a little bit. But that individual's 5P. One of our, our oldest visitor was banded back in 2001. Just some fun facts about some of our tag swans. One of our most frequent visitors had been seen 19 different times over a few year period. 
So when he was coming down or they were coming down to Riverlands, they were being seen a lot. They were staying on the sanctuary proper and they were being detected all, all of the time. Typically, when we see a tag swan, um, we only see it once, and then it's rare that we see it again for that season. It might be just out somewhere else or just where people aren't looking, but we typically only see them once. Um, but many of our tag swans that we have records for, they like to keep a tight schedule. They arrive at the sanctuary just about the same time year after year, and some of them are become quite reliable. Um, that you know when you're gonna see them again or when to start looking for them. That being said, a lot of the tagged swans, especially with those yellow tags, um, not including the GPS ones, but those were last tagged back in 2012. So that's quite a while ago. And so we haven't been seeing as many of those individuals over the years. So this little graph here shows the number of tag swans that were detected each year when we were um, monitoring. And this was either through our counts or visitors telling us that they saw this individual. So these are through many different records. But you'll see that once that started, we had a really big peak of the swans coming in around 2013, 2014, following the end of that program. And then naturally through swans um, naturally dying, Tags falling off, like Emily was saying, that they're placed on their neck to where they're fitting just perfectly. They can move up and down, but they are made to not fall off the neck, but sometimes it happens. Um, in other matters, we've been seeing fewer and fewer. And that one detection that you see in 2024 of a tag swan, that was our GPS tagged individual. So as those projects continue, we're hoping to be able to see more of those individuals over the years. So let me see if I can get my cursor in on this. Um, so you'll see this big red circle here. I mentioned 5P. 5P is the GPS tagged swan that we have seen at the sanctuary in 2022 and 2024. You'll see that if you remember our other maps, we have Missouri here. This green line here is that movement of swan 5P. So you'll notice that we start up here in one of the northern counties in Wisconsin, and that it's moved down, come to Riverlands, it's hung out in the area, it's jumped into Illinois a few times. This is a likely moving into some of those surrounding farm fields. Like I said, they typically go and loaf in corn fields in the afternoons, but also towards the end of their season with us. So typically around the end of January, early February, they start moving into Illinois more and more, and that's where they roost in stage with other swans before they head back north. So we kind of see that movement here. Um, all of these other colored lines you see are other tag swans that were in the area, but 5P is our fun GPS tag swan that, that's been hanging out with us. So swans in Riverlands today. So we are actively keeping up with management to ensure quality, quality wintering habitat for swans and other waterfowl. Um, we have a lot of our wetland areas here are actually um, gravity fed, so we can lower the water levels and feed into the water levels, depending on the time of year and what wildlife we're trying to manage for. So every winter we flood out some of those wetland sites. They might be a little low after the summer months to ensure that we have enough wetland area for all the waterfowl that come in every winter. We also do um, precise management for some of these areas. One of our spots is called Heron Pond where we typically see some of the largest numbers of swans on most years. And we also actively manage that to make sure that that's open enough for swans to come in. Um, as you can imagine, vegetation naturally kind of grows in and starts to choke things out, but we try to make sure to keep it open for the swans and other waterfowl. Um, we do continue our winter monitoring of trumpeter swans and that'll keep going for the foreseeable future. We have a great volunteer group who's just super eager and loves the swans. 
And so there's no reason for that to stop, especially when we get such good data and, and results from it. Um, we also continue to share and educate the public around trumpeter swans and their natural history. Um, Emily was mentioning earlier, we have our trumpeter swan watch. We also have our roost watch, which is for all roosting birds that come in, but we do like to focus on the trumpeter swans for that program as well. Again, just it gives more people the opportunity to see these birds, since for the most part, we're looking at the early morning and sometimes the late evening where we see the most activity of birds coming in and out. Um, so we want to make sure we give opportunities for other people who aren't willing to drive out to the sanctuary at 7 a.m. to look at swans, an opportunity to see swans at a better time. Um, and swans are continually used as one of our focal species for Audubon and the sanctuary. Again, they're a great bird for the public's eyes. We have lots of people coming in just to see the swans every winter. They call and they plan their winter season around seeing our swans, as well as the bald eagles that come down to our area. Um, and so between that and the importance of this species in the area, they're gonna continue to be used by us. So I have a few photos, fun photos from our swan seasons that I wanted to share. Um, and I think Paul actually has some comments on a few of these. So I'm gonna mute myself and let Paul talk about this photo in particular. This is in Ellis Bay and it was very cold zero for several days. So the swans and the other waterfowl kept the little bit of water open, but it provided an opportunity for the coyotes to get out there. Now the coyotes could not take a full grown swan, but they were looking for birds, ducks, or something that were uh, sick that they could get. And uh, so it, then as soon as it warmed back up, the coyotes went away, of course. And okay. Ellis Bay, for those who aren't familiar, is just right off the Mississippi River. Again, it's that viewing area that's right outside of our uh, center. So we also have great opportunities for, and Paul can definitely speak to this, for birders and photographers. Naturally, we're a bird sanctuary, um, but the trumpeter swans typically put on a really good show for all the nature lovers. Um, hearing them fly over is just fantastic. And they, like, I, like Emily's mentioned, and I'll repeat, they're a highlight for a lot of our winter bird hikes. Um, they're typically very active, and we typically see big groups of them moving through at some point of the morning. And again, here's another photo of some of our swans taking off from one of our wetland sites. And just some more fun swans in flight. And then this is our thank you question slide, but I also believe that Paul wants to chat about this photo too, because it's very rare that we see so many cygnets um, with a pair of adults. There are seven cygnets in this family and typically you see two to four, but one of the cygnets was adopted. Um, the single cygnet was with their parents and whatever reason the parents left, uh, not sure why, but the single signet was by itself for several days and then was adopted by this family, which which is uh, usual, I guess. If something does happen, they will be adopted. So, But this year, we did have one family of eight where they all came in together and they appeared to be from one hatch. So, okay. Thanks, Paul. And just because I don't think I touched on it um, earlier. So we our swans come every winter. The purpose of which I like to say is a winter vacation for the families. 
This is where they like to come winter and they do it year and year again. But also for those young adults, it's also a dating ground. This is where they find their mate for the summer and they go back north with them. And so it's a big mix of winter vacation and dating pool. This is one of the family vacation photos. So big thank you for all of you guys for joining us today. Um, there will be a survey following this webinar if you'd be so gracious to take it. Um, and now I think we will dive into some questions. Yeah, and this is this is Margaret and Jim, while you're looking for those and people, if you're putting your questions in the Q&A box, that'd be great. I do have a question for you, um, Tara, Emily, Tyler, or Paul is, um, what is the role that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers played in the creation of Riverlands? I think that that's unique to Riverlands and um, be cool to kind of share that story. I'm going to let Tyler take that question. He's here with me. Okay. So uh, the Rivers Project Office is the Corps of Engineers. Uh, we're out of the St. Louis district. And um, the creation of rivers itself and the bird sanctuary um, is basically derived from the locks and dams along the Mississippi River. So with the construction of those, um, we are also obligated to create um, and replace habitat that's lost due to construction of the navigation locks and, and dams. So that's how um, Riverlands became, uh, became a thing. Um, and then through, through that process, these areas are obviously in the confluence of two major rivers, three major river systems. Um, and the, uh, just lends itself to creating natural habitat for wetlands. So we've gone through and added water control structures, um, done, done some stuff with uh, flows um, and water channels, ditches, if you will. Um, and so we can manipulate the water levels throughout the year. So, um, you know, during the summer, we'll draw the water down to allow moist soil and vegetation to grow to provide food for waterfowl um, throughout the winter. And then um, and typically in uh, early October, we'll start adding water back into those these man-made wetlands um, to provide that overwintering habitat for all the slew of waterfowl. Great, well, thank you. Hey, um, Jim, did any questions come in that um, you'd like to be able to ask our panelists? Yeah, we have a, we have a number of questions here. So I'll just uh, get started on those. One of our anonymous attendees is wondering why we don't have power line diverters at all the power lines. Who wants to tackle that one? This is Tyler. I can attempt to tackle it, and I don't know if I have the the greatest answer. Um, so it's expensive to 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 be blunt. Um, it's done by helicopter. Um, there's no. Um, there's no directive or law saying they have to do it. It is just a a, a cooperative agreement and a um, uh, a thing that the power company has agreed to. Because the, you know the power company has has business lines they have to meet, um, but they also understand the importance of of protecting uh, wildlife, um, and so it's a good public relations for them. Um, but at the end of the day, it is expensive to do it because it's all done by helicopter. It has to be very specific people to do it that are that are like linemen that are trained to do it. Um, so the diverters themselves aren't expensive, but the process of, of doing it is expensive. And they're only on like the large high transmission lines that are typically in the flight path. Um, and then we're really only seeing power line strikes associated anymore associated with bad weather events so if it's super foggy or we had a real thick snow or something like that uh it's typically when we would see if there would to be a power line strike is when we would see see the results of that um just because the birds don't see the the lines quick enough to to, to dodge it thanks good answer uh we have a question from john i think john's in ontario He's wondering about avian influenza and specifically, have you had any uh, evidence that there's swan, swan to human avian flu transmission? Who wants to tackle that one? 
Uh, this is Tyler again. <laughs> I can I can try to tackle that one. Um, so I don't know of any direct swan to human transfers. Um, and then again, I don't know of any swan um, avian flu um, here at Rivers Project. We have had avian flu and other species, um, ringneck galls, um, a few different waterfowl species. Um, and uh, we did have one. Um, so we did have an area two years ago um, that had a ring bill gall and then a trumpeter swan and I believe a snow goose or some sort of goose species. Um, and they're all in the same area at the same time. They're all confirmed, found dead. Um, and we tested, we couldn't get to the swan. So we tested the two we could get and they were both positive for the avian flu. Um, Missouri Department of uh, Natural Resources did that testing um, through, through their program. Uh, and they both came back positive. And that was when we were having the really big influx of avian flu throughout the North America. Um, so, um, but no, no major, at least in our area, no major die-offs or disease um, associated with the avian flu and trumpeter swans. Okay, thanks, Tyler. Uh, we have a question from Chris in St. Louis. And Chris, uh, we just wanted to thank Pat and also uh, Charlie from the Corps of Engineers for some great experiences being a, a Swan Watch volunteer. And also, uh, Chris is wondering uh, about some areas that they used to monitor uh, some roosting sites outside the Audubon property and wondering if that's still part of the Swan Watch program. No, currently the Swan Watch is focused on the sanctuary proper. Um, a lot of that transition that went from the properties outside, like Columbia Bottoms Conservation Area, um, and I know a few others, I think there were some Lincoln Shield sites as well, but a lot of that transition happened before my time, um, but I know that our focus just narrowed down more to the sanctuary. So I don't know if anyone is still actively monitoring the, those sites. Um, if they are, it's more on a personal lever, level and it wouldn't be associated with our Great River Swan Watch. And if it's yeah. all right, I will add one quick note. Um, Charlie Deutsch has done so much for the Trumpeter Swan program at Riverlands. He is actually now currently with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at Two Rivers National Wildlife Refuge, which is just north of us on the Illinois River. And they do also receive trumpeter swan populations at the refuge and do keep counts of those. So those are outside of the sanctuary um, and have been run by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thanks, Emily. Great. Uh, and here's a, we have a question from Fran, who's wondering if you've done any education with uh, some of the surrounding farmers in that area. So I can touch, since I'm education manager, I guess I'll take this question. Um, so d we don't do any direct connections in terms of Audubon working directly with farmers, but it just so happens that there's so many um, private and farm lands just surrounding the sanctuary. Um, and so within the sanctuary, we do have signage that is raising awareness about uh, trumpeter swan conservation um, and we do close certain trails down during winter refuge season to get, allow them that space. Um, and I do believe that local farmers are pretty aware of that. I do know the Army Corps of Engineers has probably been connected to some of the surrounding farms um, that border the sanctuary. Uh, but as far as Audubon's education, that's the best I could answer. Tyler, I'm not sure if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, there's no direct... Um... We're um, working relationship as far as education for trumpeter swans with adjacent farmers. Um, I think they have most, most of them have a good understanding and um, there's so many to connect with. It would probably be a, a tough thing to tackle. Um, but in the winter, at least in this part of the, the world, um, those fields are fallow. So they by the time the swans have got here uh, and have started to utilize the, the fields, uh, grain fields, the waste grain in those fields, um, the farmers are done doing anything until the spring when the when the swans are gone anyway. So they're not really out there um, running them off or 
or out there with equipment. So there's not a whole lot of like farmer manipulation or, or, or anything like that going on. Okay. Uh, we have another question from John. I think John's in Ontario. He's wondering if you've uh, seen any of the trumpeters uh, from Ontario, which are marked with the, the wing tags. I think those are yellow wing tags. I don't think we have. Um, not that at least I've been, I've heard or been reported to. Um, I, Paul, have you heard of any? I don't believe we have. No. Yeah. So unfortunately, not. I will. I'll. I don't know. I always look for them, though. Okay, and we had a comment from Jack just saying, uh, "Great to see Paul, Pat, and Riverlands get the exposure." And he said he's learned some things, uh, even though he's volunteered for years. Here's a question, uh, and I think this has sort of been answered from Cynthia. Do you get tundra swans in the sanctuary, and does this make your surveys more complicated or not? Yeah, there. so there's a little bit of SWAN ID that goes with that. A lot of our volunteers have been volunteering with us for many, many years. So they're very um, tuned in to the differences between the trumpeter and the tundra swans. It's also something that we address with the public when we do education, letting them know that it's not just trumpeters out here. Sometimes if you're lucky, there'll be a decent group of tundra out and about. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a part of the learning curve with the Swan Watch, but it's easily taught by the other volunteers you already know and by our staff and our leads like Pat to help make sure that everyone's prepped to be able to make those calls on if it's a tundra or if it's a trumpeter. One of the hardest times is when it's very cold, they hunker down and, and you can't see their heads and, and they're just all together. You kind of have to wait till it warms up a tad and then you can hear the different vocalizations and you know that there's some tundra in there so you try your best to pick them out thank you for that uh here's a question from bruce conant and i believe he's in juneau alaska um he's wondering if you have any historical records of trumpeters in this area um and he also wondered if, if uh, stubble corn is the main winter food of the trumpeters. That's a question I'm interested in as well. So there's two different questions then. I'll, I'll answer the first one the best I can. And then if anyone else has any additional information, but um, I don't, I'm not aware of any historical records that at least I have access to of swans in the area be, before they started um, declining rapidly. I know our first reports that we ever mentioned is really those 1991 signets that showed up. Do you get it, Tyler? Do you have any? No, I don't. Yeah. I don't know of any historical records without going like way back. Um, yeah, no. yeah. So I don't think we have anything before those five signets on what the population might have been before um, the decline and before the recovery efforts. Unfortunately. Um, and for what they're foraging on, the the stubble's definitely probably high up there on a good given day. They're out in those fields all afternoon until it's time to come back and roost. And then they'll come back, but they also utilize a lot of the wetland vegetation. Um, like Ty was mentioning that they manage for to help germinate and grow. They'll also eat a lot of that in the wetland sites when they're there roosting or if they decide to just hang out in the wetland site all day long. Um, so it's it's a mixture, but the cornfields are probably pretty high up there. Yeah, the corn, the corn, so corn, corn to waterfowl is like your fast food. It's high, high energy, low protein. Um, it gets the job done, but it doesn't stick with them. Um, so when we do find the power line strikes, um, we will do a necropsy on them. And so I'll typically open up their gullet and their gizzards and see what they've been feeding on. And 95% of the time there's corn in, in, uh, in the swan. So uh, along with, you know, smart weed, millet, um, different things they, they'll pick out of, of the wetland and vertebrates and whatnot. Okay, thanks. Uh, so just a couple of Quick questions, sort of generic questions, which I, I can probably tackle. How long does it take a signet to mature? I believe the 
it takes a trumpeter swan something like 105 days from the time the uh, the nest is started to the time the, the cygnus can fledge. So that's like three and a half months. So it's quite a long time. How long do swans live? I think it's 20 to 25 years in captivity. It's be quite a bit less in the wild, but they are they're pretty long lived birds. Um, uh, there was another question here. Oh, somebody was curious to know uh, who they should contact, who they could contact in Wisconsin DNR to find out some information about a particular swan they might've seen. Maybe Margaret, you can add a lot one. I don't know. Yeah. Um, they can, whoever it is can just send me an email at, you know, TTSS at Trump order swan society.org. And, you know, if you have a certain swan in mind and then I'll send that to the um, Wisconsin DNR person who is in charge of all the trumpeter swan records. Okay, I think we've we've answered pretty much all the questions. There's a number of people who just uh, said that they thought this was a great presentation and they've learned a lot. So, and we're right on time here. It's, it's uh, okay. just after the hours. Well, and I want to thank everybody for, you know, attending. Um, and I certainly want to thank our uh, panelists today, everybody from Audubon and, you know, Tyler, as well and you know Tiffany and Jim and everybody for coming. Um, there will be a very short survey at when you close your browser and um, if you just answer that, your input is really important for us. And if you learned anything new or particularly interesting, we'd really like to uh, hear that as well. And we, um, if you wanna receive notices of future webinars, just let me know in your survey. Your survey responses are um, anonymous, so I don't have any clue who you are. But if you wanna receive eNews uh, webinar invites, just let me know your email and your name and um, I'll get you signed up to receive those in the future. So thank you everybody for coming and we hope to see you at the next one.